Hi, this is Frankie Pace. Every Monday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, The Frankie Pace Show brings you the best eclectic interviews done with comedians, singers, actors, playwrights, musicians, producers, directors, and people of all interest. You can also listen to comedy sketches like Ask the Godfather, Herb and Eddie, Gropa from Sesame Place, Huck and Finn, Pothead Lenny, Words of Wisdom by Habib, Talking with Grandpa, and of course, Frankie's Ranch. We're all here on www.thefrankiepayshow.com. Just on a Caribbean cruise, uh, I was working there. Anybody ever been on a Caribbean cruise? Yeah. Don't, it's real stupid. <laughs> you pay $3,000 to ride around the Caribbean on a luxurious ocean liner, eating expensive French food and drinking champagne while you visit poor, crappy, smelly, crappy little countries. <laughs> What's the point of this? <laughs> what are they burning over there? Let's go back to the ship, they have caviar. <laughs> so they kicked me off. I'll show you why here in a second. I, uh, I don't like to go to other countries though, because first thing you do when you go to other country, right? You get there, you want to exchange money. You have to exchange money. I'm sorry, I have money. I don't need to exchange money. So they make, them, they make you give them perfectly good American money, and they give you back something that looks like birthday napkins for a five-year-old. All these stupid colors, pictures of people you've never seen. This is our queen. Oh, that's an ugly woman. Devalue this. <laughs> no idea how much this stuff is worth. You see, there's four bobos to the dollar, 18 gazingas to the bobo, 40 hagangis to the... G and pretty, you just go, look, take what you want. I'm a moron. That's Bill Kirkenbauer. You may have seen him from his hit TV series, Just a Ten of Us. You may have seen him on other television shows like Frasier. Or you may have seen him in the movies with actors like Bruce Willis. And he's with us here tonight. Hey, Frankie. How you doing? Hey, you sound great, man. It's been, what, 10 years since I talked to you last? <laughs> Maybe longer than, <laughs> than that. But, you know, we were... Hey, you picked a great piece of material, by the way, I wanted to say. I liked it. I thought it was... I, I saw a lot of your stuff. I remember the bowling ball routine that was pretty funny yeah i can't do that everywhere yeah and the uh, dump truck oh, i don't think i could physically do it anymore <laughs> <laughs> and secondly uh you know i need a lot of space to do stuff, some of those things like that the dump truck was uh, unique too that dump truck routine that, that was did. one of the first bits i ever did actually um it was actually kind of contrived in that i lived in an apartment building in los angeles at the time and they had the garbage truck that would make the ding 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 so, and when i started considering doing stand-up, I said, you know, you really got to get their attention. Right. That's right. what you really need to do. Get their attention so people are... And the first place I worked was a jazz club, which, by the way, is a great place to do comedy because, you know, they listen. Right. So, so I did this in this jazz club, and I uh, said I'd like to do my impression of a garbage truck. I bent over and started making all the noises, and people would kind of quit talking, and they'd look, and it worked. You know, it got, and everybody said sound effects, and I was bent over, and, you know, people go, what's he doing? And it got their attention, and it just became my, kind of my calling card. But I really don't do that. Uh, I haven't done that bit in a long time because I would, I would have pseudo, uh, you know, because I would always uh, have the characters of a black guy and a Mexican doing the, doing the run of the garbage truck. And I'd have, of course, white people coming up to me going, well, I don't think that's uh, I said, you know, <laughs> what are you getting offended by? <laughs> I, and the Hispanics and the black people, they always thought it was pretty funny, but it was always white people go, oh, I don't think you should do that. That's not, you know. But I just kind of quit doing it because I'm, uh, you know, as you know, you, you evolve. Right. And, um, but, um, yeah, it was a great bit. It was my... Uh, signature bit for years and years well that and other inanimate object impressions i kind of in the beginning kind of got into that as a you know a style that i did you were uh, you were born in australia huh <laughs> i was born in austria oh austria how come i have australia here Either thailand I, or no you know why i saw you in thailand with the elephant i thought that was cute oh man that's a great place over yeah there. No, but, yeah i was born i was born and i was an orphan i was an orphan and really? um Salzburg, Austria. My parents were, uh, my dad was in the army over there, like, just after World War II, and uh, they, um, they adopted me. 
Uh-huh. uh-huh. And it was, uh, I was a lucky son of a bitch. That's you know? interesting. They, I was about 11 months old, and they brought me over to America, and I was kind of sick, as I, they were told me. I was, I don't have a really bad cold, and I probably might have died, actually. Yeah. Because, yeah. Uh, you know, there was not a lot of medication. It was post-war Germany, you know, or Austria, you know. So things were so, but anyway, they adopted me and brought me back to the United States, and I became a citizen, and uh, of course, I don't remember. You look like you could be Australian, though. <laughs> Australian? <laughs> You know, Frankie, I'm from wherever I happen to be at the time. When I'm in Italy, I like being Italian. Hey, I was born in Italy. What? I was born in Italy. Oh, were you born in Italy? Italy's great. You know, I love traveling. I, I feel sorry for people that don't travel or, yeah. or get to see the world. And I don't yeah. just mean, you know, your neck of the, uh, of the of a state. Because mm-hmm. it's a big world, and most of it's not, you know, like where, mm. you, you know, where people live. So I, I find it interesting going to different... I really like to travel. So I want to find out about your career. Now, you started, where did you start? At the comedy store with uh, with Bruce, um, Blue Stein and uh, Dreesen? Yeah, and- I started, uh, see, I think I got, I think I got to L.A. about 73. Well, I got there about 72, I think. It took me a year. Uh, I studied mime, actually, because I and thought vent- I could meet girls. And ventriloquism, too, right? Well, I did tri- tri- ventriloquism when I was a kid. Uh, when I was about five, I had a grandmother give me puppets. Stuff. And mm-hmm. I got puppets, and I got up marionettes, and eventually I got like a lap puppet, you know, like a Jerry Mahoney. I had a real, a real full featured one, of it, you know, like a professional one. And I, you know, I just liked doing that. It made people laugh, and I would put uh, shows on the last day of the show of, of school, you know, when I was little. And then I started doing impressions when I got like in teenage, you know, <laughs> watching people like Rich Little and uh, yeah. people like that Frank Gorshin, and do I really did impressions of impressionists doing impressions. <laughs> <laughs> but I was pretty good at it, you know, for yeah. a 13, 14 yeah. year old kid. I could hit my, you know, base. And, and I, I uh, you know, and, and eventually I think I knew that I wanted to be a, a stand up comedian. So you went to LA and you hung out at the store or you went to the improv? Well, I went to radio for a while in college. And oh, stuff. really? I went out there and then I actually started doing comedy at this jazz place I was talking Right. About. It was called the Times Restaurant. And it was out there kind of where the SAG after a federal credit unit is on Ventura Boulevard. Yeah, I know where that is, yeah. Right, right. there, I think it was right there. It was a, uh, it was a jazz place. Mm-hmm. It, had, you know, it was a restaurant, and on Monday nights they would uh, have an um, amateur uh, open mic night, and there was a guy there by the name of Michael Sherman who had a very strange act. And Michael uh, was very, <laughs> but anyway, he hosted this. And um, I started doing uh, it there on Monday nights, you know, and it worked, and it kept working, and i do things. And, and then, your, uh, your first shot on TV was? Oh, oh probably my first shot on, well, stand-up thing, was Merv Griffin, uh-huh. actually. Okay. Uh, here, I'll tell you a funny story. I was working at the comedy club one time, doing one of those 1 a.m. in the morning slots. Right, right. Like four people in the audience. This was in Westwood. And I'm sitting there, and I'm doing my act. And I see these shadow of figures kind of move along the back of the wall there, you know, and they go sit in a corner. And then there were a bunch, and I saw some of the comedians going back in that area. And they're talking, you know, they're making noise. I'm trying to do my act. There's only like, not that many people in the room. And I'm doing my act. And they were in the back there, and they heard this kind of going on. And I said, hey, why don't you shut the fuck up or go outside? <laughs> So I see this big kind of crowd of people, and they kind of disperse, and everybody goes and thing. And, they, and I get off the stage, and the, the MC goes, hey, man, he said, you must might as well just forget it, pack up, and go back to where you came from. You just kicked Merv Griffin out of the comedy club. <laughs> you just told Merv Griffin to get the fuck out of the comedy club. Ooh. Uh, <laughs> oh, my God, what have I done? Yeah. Oh, no. Oh, so I went home, and I was very depressed about it. <laughs> I could, you know, he was like Johnny, it was Johnny Carson, and then it was Merv Griffin. Right. <laughs> and uh, at the time, I had a beard and wore puka shells. Oh, God. And um, that weekend, I think I got really drunk or stoned or whatever with a girlfriend of mine, and she ended up shaving my beard off, and we got rid of the puka shells. I mean, not because of that. I think we were just drunk and um <laughs> then i so I, I mean i looked different so about two weeks later merv came back into the club didn't recognize you club, right? <laughs> different thing i did my act and there were people there and stuff and uh about three days later i got a call and and from his talent coordinator guys hey merv saw you at the club the other night and watched you come and do the show <laughs> I thought, oh okay 
okay. And I thought, what's he going to do? Right. He's going to get me out there and he's going to humiliate me. Right. He's going to tell me to get the fuck out of the studio. <laughs> <laughs> you know? what, what's he going to do? And uh, so I, uh, I went back and did the show. And a couple, after I'd done the show a few times, I asked him. <laughs> actually, he was a very nice man, actually. Yeah. Very nice man. He didn't, wasn't the kind of guy that had a big entourage of people around him right. all the time. And I asked him, I said, uh, do you remember? Uh, he goes, Oh, yeah. <laughs> he said, I don't blame you. He said, they were making all that noise. He said, I just got the fuck out. That's so cool. That's so funny. That's so cool to him to do that, really. He was very, very nice, man. Him and Mike Douglas were very nice guys and didn't have the big, you know, most of the other guys, uh, you know, they have a few people kind of circle them, you know, yeah. or a security guy hanging yeah. around. Yeah, ass kisses. like that. Ass kisses. And, uh, so there's a different, but both of those guys were just very, very nice. And I remember I remember you from, uh, uh, I don't know if you still remember this show, Fernwood Tonight? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, that was a really good show with yeah, Fred Willard. Tony Rolletti. That, that was my first acting job mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. I got the paycheck for it. Yeah. And that was just a character I made up because I had been a busboy. How did you get picked for that? How did you get that? Well, I, at the time, I sold videotape equipment. And at the time, that was something nobody else had. A TV camera and a way to record. This is like probably 1976. Right. And uh, but I sold uh, videotape equipment, so I took a camera and a VCR home, and I recorded. And I did about five or six different characters. I remember I did a dog catcher. I did because they were looking for characters to be in this little town. Right. Right. So I did different characters. I might have done a mayor. I don't know. I did, and I did this Tony Rolletti guy. And it was based on a guy where uh, I worked as a busboy at a Holiday Inn Italian restaurant, watch called Tony's. And uh, this was a, there was a guy there that would go on about eight o'clock and sing and dance, and you know, it's loosely based on the guy. Except you know, and I, so I put on a powder blue tuxedo and I did that character. And Alan Thick, who was the producer of the show, called me in and said, "Hey, that was really funny." Blah blah blah. Could you do this? And you know, next thing I know, I had a script and. And it was just mostly, it was a very strange show. It was a strange way to start out because it was, unlike most shows, very improbable. Yeah, totally unorthodox show, totally. Yeah, it was very unorthodox. It wasn't, uh, I thought that's the way. I mean, they would give you a script and then they would tear pages out of it. <laughs> Literally, I mean, actually, they'd I come up it. to you before lunch and go, here, let me see your script. And they'd tear pages out, <laughs> give you new ones. And this is after I, as a good actor, memorized everything. Oh, God. So, you know, I, I wouldn't go to lunch. Uh, I'd go back in and try to memorize yeah. it. Oh, I was changing around. And I'd go out there, and, of course, Fred and Martin Mull, uh, Fred Willard and Martin Mull, they always made me look really good because I... If I look at that stuff in retrospect, and I was just scared shitless. I didn't know what was going on. I was screwing things. But nobody seemed to mind. In fact, at one point, we went to a commercial. I saw Alan Thicke walking at me very quickly. <laughs> across from behind the camera. He coming straight at me. I could tell he was coming straight at me. And I thought, I remember thinking, he's going to hit me. <laughs> he's going to hit me. I screwed this bit, this thing up so badly. Because, you know, we transposed bits. And I just, uh, you know, uh, 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 and I thought he was going to hit me. He walked right up to me and goes, that was great. Keep it up. <laughs> he turned around and walked. I went, really? <laughs> that was great. <laughs> I screwed everything up. <laughs> did you do? Did you do make me laugh? Because I saw. I remember yeah, Vic Dunlap sure, used to about, do that. You remember Vic Dunlap, right? Oh yeah, Vic was Vic was the best man in my wedding. I, oh really? One of the first comedians I met. What a great guy! What a great oh, guy! He was he, guy. He, yeah, I, I'm so just recently it was his one year anniversary. Of, yeah, you know, diabetes. I think it was right. And you know. I still, even after I moved to Austin, he still, and I would still talk on the phone all the time. Yeah, he One had, my, I never saw an upbeat guy like him, you know, I oh, would talk I know, to him on the phone. And I, he, yeah, he never, he's not like me. I think that's why we were friends. <laughs> he, he would let things roll off his back. Yeah, Kind of yeah. go along with it. And, uh, you know, he would, you could, he was like a, Vic was like a, like a golden retriever. You could do anything to him and it wouldn't bite you. Yeah, what a, what a great guy he was. He really was. I miss him a lot. He, yeah. was, he was one of my true dear friends. You did Growing Pains and then from there you were, you were you played a coach and then from there someone said, hey, this guy should have his own series. Then you did Just the Ten of Us and that ran right, for a while. A spinoff. Yeah. How'd you like doing that show? Oh, it was great, you know. I mean, they actually did just kind of what you said. They literally called me up one day. I was, remember I was home, my wife answered the phone. She goes, oh, all the producers are on growing pains. They want to talk to you. And I'd done about four shows, maybe, maybe six. I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. 
And I thought, uh oh, again. See, I like like before. I thought they're going to hit me. <laughs> <laughs> they're going to hit me. So I, what did I do? I thought, what did I? What could I have possibly done that all four of the producers would call me up? Maybe I had my finger like in the you know fuck you sign yeah. when I was acting, and didn't know it or something. When they were editing and they're seeing it. I, you know, that's really what I thought. <laughs> I thought, why would they call me all at once? Me at home? They don't do that. You don't call people anyway. Was that taxing for you, though? That, uh, was it a lot of work for you? You felt you were overbearing with too much work, or was it just fun for you? Oh, no, it was fun. It was a lot of work, though. People don't realize how much work mm. a sitcom is. Yeah. You know, it's, it used to be, if you get really good at it after, you know, five years, you can get it down to four days. Mm-hmm. But it's a, it's a uh, Monday through Friday thing. You get there at 9 o'clock in the morning, you rehearse it. You know, you block it. You try to memorize it as good as you can. Well, you're not really not the first thing. You know, you're on book. Right. Like I, I teach classes sometimes about the sitcoms because a lot of people don't know what the procedure, you know, and all the rehearsals. It's like a little 22-minute play. It is. In fact, they bring you out. I, when I did Cosby, they brought us out like it was a play. Right. Inter- it is. Like right. They treat it like theater, yeah. like television. They introduce everybody, right? Right, yeah. yeah. And it's like a play. And, yeah. uh, you know, there are mistakes that you don't see after the editing because uh, everybody makes mistakes. Yeah. But, you, you know, you just, but it, it's a lot of work. But you rehearse it so much during that week that it's like Socrates used to say. Uh, they'd ask him, how do you remember those big, long speeches? And he said, I would picture, and this is really his memory tricks that, you know, mm. uh, that people use when memorizing things. But he said, I would picture myself going through the, through the garden here, and I would see the roses, and I would talk about the beauty of Rome. And I would picture the, you know, this and that. And, he, so as you, and the thing is, a lot of the physicality of what you're doing, Association, those yeah. words, remind you of what to say right right so when you're getting the beer out of the refrigerator you go oh i'm supposed to be yelling at her about the letter you know so, <laughs> so when you rehearse it, it the physicality really triggers a lot of the the uh, dialogue how about the spots do you find that where you got to stand all the time they you feel uncomfortable when they put you on a certain spot well you know that's part of acting on um, that you got to be able to walk and chew gum at the same time you know i see i you to finish that line at the table not yeah. halfway there I always see actors stand awkwardly. You know, they, they can never stand, like, comfortably because they put them on a spot, and they always have that, like, one knee up a little bit higher, and they, they have that awkward look. You know you know what I'm talking about when they shoot? Yeah, I do. Well, people people get feel awkward when you point a camera at them. It mostly, uh, again, sometimes when I teach improv and stuff, that, you know, really the hands are what makes people bad actors. Right, when they use their hands they too much. They do, right? and this is what you're saying about how to stand or right. cocking a leg. Right. You feel uncomfortable just being. You see actors put their hands in their pockets or fold oh, their right. arms. Oh, right, cross their arms. Yeah. Women cross their arms a lot. Yeah. Or, or what gets me is newscasters <laughs> uh, that, that, that are standing and they put their fingers together where they touch all the tips of their fingers yeah. together. Yeah. <laughs> You know, uh, and, and I always say, I said, why do you do that? Because they learned it somewhere. When you take your fingers, and now nobody, n- nobody does that. No, no nobody no, stands no. around with their fingertips no. like that. You know, uh, so it's a real insincere. I mean, I always say you might as well just put a sign around your neck that says, you know, um, I don't know what to do with my hands. Yeah. But p- p- when you point a camera at people, they do the weirdest shit. I tell you. I know that's why Brando. Brando was phenomenal when it came to camera work. He just oh yeah well, played you with know his how lip. To work or... If you don't, but people in general, regular people, when you point a camera at them, especially a film or you know video camera, they they put start putting on doing things that they wouldn't. No, they don't know do. how. Like you said, they don't know how to just stand there right. and be themselves. You've done a lot of done. You've done a lot of work, a lot of television work, also film. You did Airplane, and you did a story. Of, oh, how was it with, working with Bruce Willis? How was that? Oh, he was very funny. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'll tell you a story about that too. We were in Venice. I, it was the one part of the movie that happened in Venice, Italy. <laughs> so <laughs> I got to go to Venice, Italy. Great. And I'm sitting in, um, and Bruce is very nice, very accessible guy. I'd love to work with him again. Um, and uh, we were sitting in the lobby of a very expensive hotel. I forget which one, which one it was. We were sitting in the lobby, and he, he was in, on one couch, and I was about three, four feet away on another couch. We were waiting for a boat, I think, to take us somewhere. Mm. And he's like two Italian, really hot-looking Italian girls come walking up through the lobby, and they look at him, and they walk over, and they go, Oh, a Bruce Willis! Bruce Willis! <laughs> and they all oh, Bruce Willis, he's, uh, he's still sitting down, and, you know, he's talking to him, and blah, 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 and, 
You know, and then finally he says to him, you know, he says, when I get done acting, you know, this is, this is after he's broken up with Demi. He says, um, you know, maybe you can come back to the hotel and we could, you know, and they go, oh, Bruce the Wheelers, and they laugh at him, and they walk away. Mm. <laughs> and I said to him, you know what? I said, I don't feel so bad now. Even you can't pick up chicks. <laughs> <laughs> Because <laughs> they just kind of blew him off and walked away. <laughs> How, airplane must have been pretty wacky for you, right? Doing that film? Yeah, well, that was just a day's work. I oh, got a oh. In fact, I'm not even listed for some reason. I realized yeah. recently that I'm not listed in the credits at the end, but I'm in the I'm in the middle ward. Yeah, and uh, you right around uh, Ethel Merman and the guy that's got his uh, leg wrapped up around his neck, posing with the exploding uh, jeep and the baby in his arm. Mm-hmm. I'm right in there. I'm in a bed. I'm a crazy guy in a bed. You've also done like Frasier and Night Court and Joni Loves oh. Chachi and God, you did so much stuff. But I, uh, I like sitcoms. I really do like sitcoms. Yeah. Uh, you, I, I feel if they're done right, there there's really nothing. <clears throat> there's really nothing like them. But you also have your own production company, right? What is it called? Bald Guy Productions? Is it Bald Guy Productions? Uh-huh. Uh huh. Where I produce my Legends of Comedy show. Legends of Comedy. What's that? <clears throat> well, it's it's. Uh, it's at legendsofcomedy.com, okay. and it's a comedian lookalike show. I thought of it oh. back around 1996. I had a friend of mine that... Oh, that's the one with Rodney and Roseanne, and uh, yeah. you did a bunch of... Oh, I mean, now I remember that one. Sure, yeah. yeah. How's, is he, a, you still you know, doing Bill it? Bill Cosby, I have, uh, you know, George Burns, Red Skelton, you know, Larry and the Cable Guy, right. and uh, I put on a show, and I, I do a lot of corporate shows with it. I do... Uh, uh, Occasionally, I do some casino things like that, but it's, mm-hmm. a, it's a production show, and it's a fantasy show, but it's the only comedian look-alike show right. uh, that I know of in the world. There's lots of Michael Jackson, uh, you know, Madonna-type right. look-alike like, shows, yeah. Elvis shows. Things. Singers, mostly singers. Uh, but there's really no uh, other show uh, like The Legends of Comedy. It's a great show, because, you know, not everybody likes country music, just, uh, not everybody likes uh, opera, but everybody likes to laugh. You still do motivational speaking? Well, sometimes I, I do. Um, I uh, When you do corporate shows, uh, they like to think you have a message. So sometimes I take my own personal outlook uh, at a business, you know, because I, I run a business myself. I just don't have a store. Or anything. Yeah. But, you know, I talk to businesses about, um, you know, how they, you know, there's lots of people that do this. Talking about customer service mostly. Mm-hmm. But it is because you know it's a lot about customer service. Um, you know, counting, counting back the change to people, actually counting back the change, and instead of making that pile of uh, coins and dollar bills and stuff, um, things like that. I try to do it in a humorous way. Uh-huh. But yeah, I, I do that. I, I, you know, listen, I'll talk to anybody <laughs> for a length of time if they if they uh, if they pay me. So, what part of Texas are you living in? You're down there now, right? I live. I live in Austin, Texas, which I like because I moved here about seven years ago. I like it because it's in the middle of the country. Yeah. And so I'm not too far from anywhere. You got a horse? Uh, no, I don't have a <laughs> horse. I know a guy that has a few horses. Really? Is it is it that wide open where you are? That no, you... no. I live outside of Austin. Oh, I okay. live in a place called Lakeway. Okay. It's kind of there's a big lake here. Uh, Austin, the Austin area doesn't look like you would think Texas looks like. And it doesn't look like what most of Texas looks like. Mm-hmm. It's flat kind of land. It's what they call the hill country. And there's a lot of hills and mountains and uh, uh, trees and things like that. It's very, very nice here. It's, a, it's the prettiest part of Texas. Yeah. I don't think I would live anywhere else, so the coastal line is very nice. Texas is a great, a great place. I mean, we have coastline and we have mountains and we have rivers. And people don't think of the Texas having rivers and stuff. And, it's a, it's a great uh, it's a great place, and again, it's in the middle of the country. Yeah, but nothing beats Thailand, right? Eh? Uh, Thailand <laughs> is great. My, my son is over there right now. He's um, going to college there. I saw you know those funny pants and that t-shirt you were wearing, man. You look oh, so relaxed. Yeah, well, it's kind of hot and humid over there, but it's a magi- very magical place. Yeah, I'm, it must I'm be. Probably going to retire there. <laughs> um, no, I'm serious. Really. I'm, very serious. Well, good for it's a, you. It's a great place, and it's a long ways away. But you know what? It's it's uh, the cost of living is very inexpensive. Mm. People are nice. They're very polite. They're um, it's, anything you want, you can get over there. Anything you want from here, they got over there. They got Swenson's ice cream. They got McDonald's. They got you know. Right. Uh, I mostly eat uh, Asian food, but it's 
so modern. It's modern, and yet there are places of it that are uh, very old and have a lot of character, and that's what I like about it. They have elephants, they have monkeys, they have most of the place, uh, you know, besides Bangkok, which looks like an Asian New York, uh, what doesn't look like that looks like Hawaii. <laughs> have you ever been back to Chicago? <laughs> oh, yes, Chicago. That's the place that we, uh, we worked uh, together. I remember that. I was the highest paid opening act in the history of stand-up comedy. <laughs> yeah. I think I probably still hold the record. <coughs> I don't know what that was all about. They hired me as I a... I what it was about. I told you what it was about. It, 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 just for a story. It's one of my great stories, actually. Mm. You were part of one of my great stories, oh. which was I had a three... When I had my sitcom, I had a three-part deal with that comedy club there, the funny firm. Right. Uh, I was, it, it, three different times I was supposed to go there and appear uh, for like two nights each. I went there the first time just for one night, and it was very rowdy. One of the most rowdy places I'd ever seen. People walking from table to table, people talking. It was a nightmare. Yeah. And so uh, the next time when I back, went back, I, um, I said to my manager, I said, boy, this place is really rowdy and crowded, and they didn't make all sorts of noise and people yelling stuff. And he said, well, why don't you get a bodyguard? And I said, hey, okay, and I'll be like Elvis. <laughs> I thought maybe walking me up to the stage there would be, you know, enough to shut people up. Right, right. I got this guy, and I didn't buy a hire a thug. I hired a bodyguard. Uh, he was a black guy. I forget what his name was. He had a shaved head, very handsome, carried a gun. Professional <laughs> bodyguard. I paid a lot of money when I was in Chicago. I didn't think it was a bad idea to have a bodyguard. <laughs> So uh, they came, so the first day he walks me down, and he, I said, now, when you walk me up the stage, turn around and look at everybody, like, don't fuck with him. Right, right, right. <laughs> and, uh, and, and so he puts me on, and so I'm there, about the second show, I got some guy that starts screwing with me, hey, what country was it? I don't know, I was doing a joke, and he kept saying, I remember him kept saying, what country was it? No, what country no. was it? And, you know, it didn't matter. I said, you know, so finally I said to my guy, I said, could you come down here and get this? So he came down. And walk this guy, escorted him out. People go to, so, you know, the, the, the show was over. And the club was so mad at me. But they didn't have a, they had a bouncer that my wife could beat up. <laughs> and they weren't in the room. And they didn't, you know, you right. don't pay attention to a comedy show. Yeah, right. But they took this jerk and he was a, he was, a, he was a problem. Instead of kicking him out, they bought him a bottle of champagne. He yeah. won a prize for fucking with Bill. Yeah, it's like a cru the cruise ship mentality, you know. That, exactly. Yeah, yeah, they do that on the cruise ship. Avoid the assholes. Because right. Because we're so offended that, uh, we're so sorry we had to point it out to them that they were assholes. Right. We, we don't want to lose the customer. So I went, no. and, and they, plus they didn't like the fact that I had hired a black guy. And yeah. this was a black guy kicking them out, because they were oh. all a bunch of goomba guys. Yeah. And they didn't like that. So I went home, and my agent says to me, well, they're not allowed. They, 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 they've called them, and they don't want you to come in back. Mm. They don't uh, want you coming back doing that third. I said, no, they have to. If they don't want me coming back, that's fine, but they got to pay me. Right. Oh, right. they're not going to do that. I said, well, then, then I'm coming back, and I have an arbitration clause in my contract. Right. And they looked at it, and they knew they had to <laughs> pay me. And they, you know, so they were going to make, so that night when I got there, and this is when they had hired you to headline, and they said to me, you're opening your opening for Frankie Pace this week. You only do 10 <laughs> minutes and get off the stage. And I think they thought I was going to go, what? What do you mean I'm not the headliner? And I just said, oh, great. Right. <laughs> I let the, you know, burn my ass off for, you know, 45, 50 minutes. Great. Right. I, I, I had to. I <laughs> 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 think they thought I was going to get mad. So, uh, you know, as well as I do, I do my 10 minutes there, and then I go over and eat Chinese food while you headline the show. Right, because they thought they had it in their mind, you know, this will really piss Bill off and he'll leave. Because they thought it was going to yeah. piss me off. Yeah. I thought it was funny or it was it was hysterical <laughs> and i think i forget what i got it was a lot of money i think i got like seven grand that week that's unbelievable <laughs> <laughs> good and I for you said, fine if you want to make me the highest paid opening act in comedy club history yeah that's okay with me they were mad they were mad at me too at the end for some reason Why? i don't know i don't know who knows nothing that, to do with it who cares i i don't care if i never worked there again and i ne haven't never worked there again it's, no, it's still there too. I think I, I would never work there. Who cares? And you know that's the problem with comedy clubs. They, they, you know, you gotta watch the crowd. But anytime you get a bunch, uh, I can't tell you how many times I've had to explain to club owners that you can't let one, two, three, or a table of people screw up the show. It's I a listening I'm art. A it, I'm not a bouncer. It's a listening art. You know that they they don't get it. They just want to sell the oh, drinks. Because they've never been up on a stage 
And no one that has never been up on a stage could ever, ever understand what it is like to be up there. And they say, you know, I've had people say, but a heckler still go, just ignore him. Yeah, right. Ignore him. And I go, okay, I'll tell you what. Let me write you uh, 23 three digit numbers down here, and I'm going to want you to add them with a pencil. And while you're doing that, I'm going to whisper in your ear 1742, 19, 2, 7, 3, right, right, 7, right. 3. Just ignore me, but just ignore me. And see, see if you get the right number. I always hate the guy that's really quiet and the, he's so he's so low. And only you could hear him being an asshole, but the rest of the people can't, and they think there's something wrong with you because you're picking on the guy. You ever have that? Well, yeah, but you know, you don't. Yeah, I mean, heckling is not just heckling. It's when people are talking. Yeah. When they're not, when they're sitting like at a movie theater. If you're gonna go sit there and drink and watch a show, then watch a show. Don't sit there. Go home. Talking at home is free. Why are you going to pay $10 to come in a club there and talk while I'm on stage? I know. (laughs) And it's just, you know, what it is, is there's a percentage of people that are assholes, and then you put them in a club, and there's a percentage of people that are assholes there, too. And then sometimes those percentage of assholes, they get drunk. Now what you've got is a percentage of drunk assholes. (laughs) That's true. (laughs) That's true. It's just... you know, I had a, I had, a, I worked. You know, governors. You work governors, right, in uh, Long Island. I, I work, yeah, that's kind of a rowdy club. But yeah. I found them. I don't know. It was rowdy. I remember. It was I had rowdy. such a rowdy group that uh, I started getting an argument with them. Having <laughs> terrible problems. Yeah, the guy was the guy was so drunk. He got he jumped up. He went to grab me to pull me off the stage, and I had these elastic pants on, and he pulled my pants down and <laughs> and my underwear <laughs> and my underwear. I'm standing oh, there with my Johnson and hanging out. I had a guy in in St. Louis come up on the stage after me. Uh, I remember who it was. It was him and his girlfriend, and then his boss and his girlfriend, <laughs> this audience, and they were right, you know, about two rows back, and sitting there talking. Well, and finally, you know, I try and I say, you know, I don't want to interrupt uh, your conversation with my show, <laughs> you know, but, um, and so it turns from that into, hey, shut the fuck up, you idiot asshole. Yeah, yeah, and, and then the you're the bad guy. The girl stands up. She was like a slut. She stands up and goes, well, you can't talk like that to, me, to him in front of me. Uh, what she said, you can't talk like that to me in front of him. <laughs> like volunteering him for a fight. <laughs> Next thing I know, this guy comes up on stage and takes a sway at me. And he grazed my eye. But I pulled back and got my uh, mag light, my police mag light, out of my bag at the same right. time and broke his, uh, broke his nose. <laughs> I, 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 I rubbed it across the front of his face <laughs> with, with intense force. <laughs> and he went down like a Mexican bull in a bullfight. I guess we've bull, all... You ever we, seen a bullfight when they sever the spine of the yeah. bull? They just drop. <laughs> we've all had that, Forward I guess. Motion. There's no momentum. They just drop. Yeah. Oh, That's God. what this guy did. And of course, you know, they called the cops and, the, and they dragged him off. And I remember I hit him so hard, a, a lighter came out of his shirt and landed on the stage. And I picked it up and said, well, I guess I got a free lighter out of the bit. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people think it's a bit sometimes. They think you're acting when that shit happens. Well, you know, what's his name At- uh, did that a lot? Um, uh, Latka, what's his name again? Oh, God. Oh, Andy, Andy Andy Kaufman. Andy Kaufman would do that all the time. Yeah, but, you know, I just want to go up there, have a good time, put on my show, and go home. And, you know, the percentage of times when I have trouble is very insignificant, and it's usually nothing that couldn't be dealt with by someone who wasn't busy doing a show. Yeah, yeah. You know? Well, you know where very comedy good. really belongs is in a theater, where they got to look and listen. Well, oh, theaters are great. Everybody's yeah. in a line. Right. You know, they're all nice and neat, usually nicely dressed. You know, it's a, it's a decorum you have to have mm. in a show. You can't let one person or two people screw up a show for 300 other people. Right. It's just bad business sense to let that happen. Yeah. More than you'd let somebody take a shit in the middle of your restaurant. <laughs> you know? Well, on that note, Bill, I want to thank you for coming on my show. <laughs> well, sure. It was great. <laughs> and uh, you did 34 minutes, you little stinker. Did I really? Yeah. Hey, listen, I'm a talker. <laughs> that was really interesting. You're a great I'm guy. I'm and he'll just talk about <laughs> it. I, I got the... Hey, listen... Uh, I'm going to be having my podcast here pretty soon, too. Okay. I'm start a podcast. Good for you. Yeah, I think it's a great thing. I congratulate you on yours. Thank you, Mr. Kirkenbauer. Kirkenbauer. Not Kirschenbauer. Kirkenbauer. It's Kirken. 
Kirkenbaugh, yeah. So it looks like Kirshen. Mm-hmm. And there's another story about Bill Cosby. We won't go into this. We'll okay. that over that. Okay. <laughs> well, good luck with your podcast, and I hope it does very well for you. Thank you. It's called I Hate Humans. <laughs> Isn't that a great name That's, for it? It is. Podcast? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Human. Okay, I'll go with it. Yes. Thanks for coming on the show, and I really appreciate you. Really appreciate you taking the time to come on here. Okay. Well, thank you very much. All you. right. Take care. That was Bill Kirkenbauer, comedian, actor, writer, producer. You name it.